Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with, let's see, volume four in Profil's Mravinsky edition. Here it is, 10 CDs worth. Now, this has the earliest Mravinsky recordings, and so they are the most sonically questionable. And I do mean questionable. Most of them were captured between the, the late 40s and the 50s up to about, I think, 61 or 62. I'm going to tell you what's in here, and we'll do it bit by bit for all 10 discs. And this is really historical stuff. I, I am a great admirer of Moravinsky and the Leningrad Phil. They were wonderful when they were on, but it was very much a situation that was kind of like Fort Wengler. I mean, he was much more disciplined than Fort Wengler, and he got much better results technically than Fort Wengler did. But he, he recorded, he was only captured for the most part. He recorded live, and, and God knows what was going to happen. And the real problem is the engineering. You know, just awful, awful, awful sonics. I mean, let me tell you a story. When I was a kid, um, and there was a time when I was a kid, I, I, you know, shared a room with my brother. And, you know, we were in a not very large house at the time. My parents were just starting out. We were young. I was like eight or nine or ten. And I had a little toy transistor radio, which I used to listen to WQXR, which many of you know. That was the radio station of the New York Times then. It has since been sold off and is now part of National Public Radio. But it, at the time, it was the radio station of the New York Times, and it was a classical radio station, and they had you know, programming in the evening. They had all kinds of fun programming. You know, they had first hearing, which I later actually be, was on <laughs> with George Jelinek. And then they had, you know, the overnight programming with all kinds of really good pieces. And that's how I learned a lot of music, listening to my little transistor radio when I was eight, nine, ten. Because I was, I was a freak. I mean, I just had to hear music even then. And I would, I couldn't play it loudly because my brother was sleeping in the bed at the other side of the room there across the floor in a not terribly large room. And so what I would do is I would put the radio under my pillow to muffle it. And I would just lay on top of the radio with the pillow in the middle. I mean, I could hear it perfectly well. Well, that's about what a lot of this sounds like. If you want to hear music, classical music with huge dynamic range, often superbly played, you know, through what sounds like a cheap kitty transistor AM radio in monophonic sound heard through a pillow, sometimes two pillows, you're in business. That's what you're going to get. So be forewarned. Um, but this is very inexpensive. And for historical, historical recording collectors, um, you, may, you may want to get some of this stuff. And I'm going to tell you what's in it and what the dates are. So at least you'll know if you already have it or um, if you're interested. And I do warn people, normal people, normal classical music lovers do not buy historical recordings generally. Just avoid if you don't know the works, if you don't know the music really well, listen to modern, great-sounding performances that are great performances as well because there are tons of them. Get to know the music. And then if you're curious about historical recordings or famous names that you want to explore, then do it. Because it always helps. It helps immeasurably to know what the piece sounds like to know what it's supposed to sound like, to know what it is. So you can listen to the performance, you can hear what's there, you can hear what's missing, and you can triangulate the interpretation based on your own knowledge of what the music ideally sounds like under good circumstances. It really is the best way to do it. I, I'm totally convinced that really works. So little little bit of friendly, fatherly, or uncle advice from Uncle Dave. Just be, be cautious. So what do we have? So we've got three discs of Beethoven. You've got symphony number two from 1940. I think that's the earliest thing here. Some of these were studio recordings or they were radio broadcast recordings is what they were. So they should have sounded better, but they, they don't. Often they don't. And this is 1940 anyway from Studio Moscow. Then we've got the fourth symphony from 1955, live in Prague. Sounds lousy. And then we've got the Eroica from 1961, live in Bergen. Sounds lousy. And then we've got the fifth, 
1949 from Studio Leningrad. Sounds lousy. And then we've got The Pastoral, 1962 live from Leningrad. Sounds really lousy. And then we've got The Seventh, 1958 from Studio Leningrad. Not bad. It actually sounds, it's a mono recording, but it has reasonable air around the instruments and they don't distort wildly at the climaxes. It's, it sounds better. And it's a very good performance. It really is. It's life and lively and exciting. It's, it's very good. Okay, then we've got the Ruslan and Ludmila Overture, which he did 100 million times. We're already up to CD4, so this is not going to take a long time. Um, this is from 1958, live in Leningrad, and it sounds like hell. Oh, my God, they sound awful. And then we've got Lyadov's Baba Yaga, the symphonic poem, which sounds about the same, 1959, live in Moscow. And then we have the Legend of the Invisible City of Kitej Suite. Um, and that one is, hmm, does it tell us? Does it say? Uh, oh, there it is, 49, studio broadcast from Leningrad. Nothing sounds worse than badly recorded Rimsky-Korsakov. I mean, the guy just demands great sonics. We all know that, right? And then we've got Francesca de Rimini from 1948. Studio Leningrad, very exciting. Oh, it's so exciting. You know, uh, Ravinsky had the Leningrad Orchestra playing with such power, especially from the strings. I mean, not even Karakarian matched Leningrad for the sheer weight and force that he could summon from his string sections. I mean, they had a physical impact, a density to the sound that was just extraordinary. There's never been anything else like it. You really hear it in this Francesca. Unfortunately, that's all you hear. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. All right, next, Shostakovich 11 from 1953 live. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it was almost a premiere at that point. Uh, again, it sounds like hell, but it's, it's a very exciting performance. The Festive Overture at A Major, 1955, live from Leningrad. Same concert, probably. Who knows? It sounds just as terrible. Um, Galina Ust Ustvolskaya, Children's Suite for Symphony Orchestra. Now, that's interesting. 1954, live from Leningrad. Now, a lot of these performances, they don't sound too terrible at lower dynamic levels. You can hear them, and it's okay. But as soon as more instruments come in and the sound begins to pick up above mezzo forte, you get the distortion and the wow and the flutter and the breakup. And the, uh, you know. Fortunately, there's not a lot of that stuff in the children's suite. And then we've got the Shostakovich Violin Concerto, 1956 broadcast studio with Leningrad and David Oistrach. And it's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful, as you might expect. The violin comes out very, very clearly. It's way out front. The orchestra is in Moscow. He was in Leningrad, something like that. Maybe they were in Vladivostok and he was in Leningrad. And then you've got the Boris Klusner Violin Concerto from uh, March 29th, 1957. It doesn't say where it was recorded. It just has a date. And the, and the, the soloist is Michael, Michael Weirman. Um, and it's a typical piece of sort of socialist, realist schlock stuff, as you might expect. Then we have the Schubert Unfinished. Well, that's nice. And the Bartok, that's from Moscow in 1959. Um, you now, you see, there are other versions of virtually all of this repertoire and better sound by Moravinsky. So like I said, this is a set for hardcore Moravinskyites because you can, even, even his later live lousy sounding recordings have less lousy sound than this lousy sound. It's just the way it is. Then you've got the Bartok music for strings, percussion, and celesta, which was one of his signature works for that orchestra. This was recorded in Budapest in Bartok land and, uh, in 1962. And I'm sure that even in 1962, six years later, they were thrilled to see the Russians performing in Budapest. Oh, yeah. Again, there are other versions of this work in better sound that are better played and just sound, it's just better than this one. Then we have CD8, Sibelius III, 1963 live, and The Swan of Twinella, 1961 live. Uh, the, the Sibelius is a good performance. It's an interesting performance. You know, as you might expect from Ravinsky, it's kind of swift and unsentimental, and it sounds like hell. Mm -hmm. Then we've got Glazunov's Fourth from 1948. Well, that says all you need to know. Leningrad Studio Broadcast and the Entre Act to Act Three from Raimonda, the ballet. Um, this is all from uh, this is from 1962, live in Budapest. 
So, you know, there you go. Um, and it doesn't sound any better. Then we've got CD9, Cacciatorian, the Piano Concerto with Lev Oborin and the Czech Philharmonic, 1946. Oh, unfortunately, it's 1946. And we have the uh, Symphony Number no. 3, the Symphony Poem, the most awful symphony ever written in the 20th century, the biggest, noisiest piece of crap anybody ever churned out. And this is allegedly the premiere. It's for, for organ and 15 solo trumpets. Can you imagine how wonderfully that sounded in 1947 live? I mean, there's a, you know, in, in, in a perverse way, the wretched sonics kind of you know flatter the piece it's sort of des they deserve each other you know they really do and then we've got alexander arutunian his festive overture which is you know festive and socialist realist from 1949 and last but not least on cd10 arno babayanian arno babayanian's violin concerto in a major with leonid kogan oh boy that's from 1949 live in leningrad I'll bet he never played it again after that. Like, not memorable work, but, you know, it's Kogan. It's kind of fun. And then we've got a bonus. The bonus is excerpty things. You get the, the ball from the Symphony Fantastique from 1949 in Moscow with the USSR State Symphony Orchestra and the Dance of the Sylphs from 1962 in Budapest and the List Mephisto Waltz Number no. 1 from 1947 from Leningrad, a broadcast and the DBC Clarinet Rhapsody with, with Vladimir Krasavin. Yeah, that's the name, Krasavin. Um, and the, that's all with Leningrad, and it doesn't say the date for that particular one, but do we care? No, we don't. So there you are, this entire 10 disc set of basically dreadful sounding Mravinsky in repertoire he mostly did elsewhere. Um, and for Mravinsky collectors, it's self-recommending. For the rest of normalcy, um, it is really uh, not necessary. Truly not necessary. I, you know, I, I wish I could say otherwise, but that's just the reality. And reality is my middle name. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.